with authority. Our with authority under quarantine series continues. <laughs> Larry Beal, uh, Chris Alvarez, Casey Pratt, and our special guest is a man I've known for so long. Eric Burns, man, myth, legend, motivational speaker. I want to run down just a few things from your resume. An 11 year big league career. All the A's fans love you. Uh, they love you in, in Arizona. Uh, now you're with the MLB Network as an analyst. You run marathons, you run triathlons, you played 24 hours of golf. But I want to start with something I did not realize until I was doing some reading. Perhaps your greatest athletic achievement you sacked Tom Brady three times in a high school football game. Did you did you stand over him and say, how about this greatest of all time? Yeah. No, but we did stand over him and say, hey, man, don't worry about it. You can't throw a football from your back. So I'm sure you're a lot better than your, uh, your Sarah team is letting on. So if you think about it, it's funny because back in the day, you know this because of Barry Bonds and Greg Jeffries and – Sarah went through a run of producing unbelievable baseball players. So they became known as the baseball school. Whereas St. Francis, and you can trace this back to maybe uh, Doug Cosby or whoever it was, that they had a run of unbelievable football teams um, led by the great uh, coach Ron Calcagno. Still to this day, probably the best coach I've ever had in any sport. But it's funny because, um, you know, Brady actually used to crush us on the baseball field. And so, I mean, the story I tell, and I've told it several times, so forgive me if you've heard it before, but I say, I don't know what's more ironic that Tom Brady hit the furthest home run I ever saw hit in a high school baseball game. And it, it landed across the street from my Catholic high school on top of the Planned Parenthood building. So I don't know what's more ironic, the fact that Tom Brady hit the homer, the fact that we had the Planned Parenthood building across the street from my Catholic high school. It's a little twisted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the way you wove that. I had no idea where that story was going, but I like the ending. That was very really good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's, it's, um, it's interesting because now right down the street here too, we, uh, Kevin Euclid married julie brady tom's sister and i don't i mean i could point like four or five houses over and, and that's where uh that's where they are kevin dropped off he's got the great loma brewing company down in los gatos and last night he came up and dropped off this uh new mexican uh lager that he had with a little twist of lime and it was fantastic so small world Somebody's doing quite well in quarantine in Lake Tahoe. Uh, guys, jump on in here. Well, I believe that um, Eric was upstairs because he was about to give us, like, the tour back down to the treadmill. So I don't know if you want to start that right now, and then we well, can get into more Q&A. Here, here's the thing, and I, I'm, I'm very serious about this, and it's not for a fact that it wasn't even for show or anything else, but obviously we've all been locked up here in our houses for a number of days now. Um, and early on, I just started – doing a bunch of miles on the treadmill. Now, it started with 15. I was doing 15 a day, and I did that for like five, six days. And I'm kind of – I thought to myself, I'm like, am I coming up short here? Because here we are in this whole COVID-19 crisis, and I'm doing 15, and it's like I'm going to let this 19 beat me. And so I said, just kind of on basic principle, I'm going to take it up to 20. So then I started doing 20 a day. Um, and then there was a day, actually, I was supposed to do this Ultraman triathlon in Arizona that got canceled, obviously. And on the third day of that would have been the 52.4-mile double marathon run. So I knocked out 52 that day, which is the furthest I've gone so far on the treadmill. Um, but on day 24 of the quarantine is when I hit, I hit my 500th mile. Um, Sure, I get it. There's a lot of people at home who probably be saying, you know, he's probably doing this just to escape his wife and his children. And there's a lot of truth in that. So, yes, it, it is the reason why I go spend several hours a day down there. But it's also to maintain the mental clarity in myself, and I'm able to come up here and be a functioning father and husband and whatnot. So I, I've done, because of the Let Them Play um, documentary release that we just had, you know, two nights ago, I actually had eight interviews uh, seven, you guys are the eight, uh, seven interviews today. And I did every one of them on the treadmill just because 
if I'm gonna, if you're gonna want to knock out 20 a day and still function and have a day, you kind of number one, you got to get up early and starve. But the other thing is, is you kind of have to be able to function and and move on the treadmill at the same time. So that was uh, that was it. How does the mentality work? I mean, I, I was a distance runner all through high school. I still run now. I know Chris does too. Larry has an Achilles issue that flares up occasionally. But, I mean, is it harder to get through the, those runs mentally or is it more hard to get through physically? Because I, I would guess mentally. I can't run that long without losing my mind. Yeah, I think the mental hurdles are obviously the number one thing you, you have to get over. Um, you do have to get – when you're talking about, I think, distances beyond the marathon, you have to get comfortable with being really uncomfortable and just understanding that it's, it's going to start to hurt a little bit. Um, you know, everything for me, though, is, is an opportunity in, in every minute I spend on there. It, it's not – yes, there's some therapeutic time where I'll check out, and maybe listen to music, maybe listen to nothing, but I don't know how you guys are and how you consume, you know, your books and – uh, whatnot, but uh, I'm a huge audiobook guy, so I I slay one audiobook after another on there. And you know, there's t- two things my dad always said. He's like, I give you no one can ever take away. It's education, experience, and that's something that number one, like I've always taken to heart. So I've always tried to continue to educate myself and also give myself. And now, obviously, having three kids, to give them those experiences. Um, but yeah, that's, um, it's just an awesome opportunity to be able to, to, to put the, uh, the headphones on and, and dial into, uh, some audio. I'm reading a, a book. It's about 10 years old, maybe a little older. It's called the blue zones. Now it's fan. It's fascinating. All about the, uh, I think it's like six different blue zones where people just outlive other people and they sort of looking at the reasons why and, and whatnot. So that's the one I'm currently, uh, currently fascinated with. Eric, you talk about being physically on the run. You're so used to traveling across the country and working at MLB Network, being on the run that way. Are you missing that? I mean, obviously missing talking about baseball and then kind of run us through your routine, the cross country flights and the media stuff that you do. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny guys. It's, I mean, it's a lot, right? Like we're all, we're always moving. We're all, we're constantly um, on the go. And so I think now it's, this has put my world to a halt. Um, with the exception of the, the treadmill work. Um, and I think it's also um, allowed me to slow down a little bit. And I think when we slow down, it's amazing how we speed up. And it's like, I, sometimes I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off and, you know, trying to get this done, this done, this done, that done. Well, you know, it's pretty amazing, you know, how much we actually can accomplish when whew, kind of take a deep breath and, and, and come under the moment and, and realize how efficient and effective um, we could be. The one thing I'll say, like, and, and, you know, this started all the way back in college and and really even kind of before that is just like, I've always been um, very consistent with a routine. And the thing about being able to get up in the same bed, night in and night out, and kind of establish that routine, that's the one thing that, you know, even as routine oriented as I was, when you're traveling from city to city, it becomes very difficult. So, you know, to be able to be here in one spot, um, of course, I'm like the rest of us, you know, I miss sports in general, obviously miss baseball, miss going to work. Uh, but at the same time, this has been, um, it's been a blessing in disguise in a lot of ways. Can you give us a tour of the, the, the Chateau de Burns in uh, Lake Tahoe? Yeah, I mean, so Larry, this is it. So I'm upstairs right now in my, in my office, right? So what we got here is there's the three screens, just in case. Now, originally, when I built this house, I was working for KMBR. And so the thought was, if I was going to be up here and doing shows and whatnot, and so there's the old ISDN line and everything else, and man, myth, and legend, Pat Tillman there in the corner. But, um, yeah, basically, this is uh, this is it. I Walk down here, there's the UCLA pick, um, a lot of Digme stuff. Here's an article uh, that Susan Slusser wrote that was pretty cool, all about the ultra running stuff. Um, a field in Arizona, Sala Morris, my man. Um, and then this is where it gets interesting because we have the uh, K 
Jeff Clark. Look at that monster wave. So I don't know if you guys, you guys could tell, but look how he signed it. Go big. Nice. Oh, dude, it's, it's, it's sick. And then this right here was from the triathlon across the uh, country. And this was uh, obviously the seven-mile swim and 2,400-mile bike and 900-plus-mile run that we did. And that's kind of a little souvenir from that. Um, and then, of course, you guys in the Bay Area. I mean, this is, this is pretty cool. Frank Menachino got this for me. And so it says, to Eric Burns, keep the Goonies looking good, Joe Montana. And so that was we, – we called ourselves the Goon Squad back in the day, right, of all the guys that would come off the bench and do well or whatever. Or our thought and idea was to come off and do well. We're like, the Goonies got it, the Goonies got it. So uh, Frankie, uh, I guess, ran into Joe and, and ended up he – he knew how much I loved Joe and he had him sign that uh, for me. So that was pretty cool. But this is this, my wife's birthday today. Say happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Yeah. Wait, we had, wait a second. We had a big, <laughs> well, we're, up, Larry? We are, we're interrupting the birthday celebration for a podcast. That's that seems wrong. Well, you guys are you're not you're interview number eight. It was wrong that I did eight interviews on her birthday. So that's 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 my fault, not not your guys. You guys you guys are the tail end. Don't worry about it. Look at cru look at cruiser balls right here though. Yeah, we yeah. call them cruiser balls. I'll. Let you guys use your imagination for that one. Now, here's the new puppy. This one's a controversial one because his name's Altuve. And whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, he's a mini bulldog. There's no wires attached. Um, you wow. know, despite, despite what <laughs> despite what people say. So uh, he's a yeah, he's a tricolor merle mini bulldog, which is is very rare and very lazy, made it up the driveway for the first time tonight so you're you're on your treadmill now and i saw you posted uh recently was it an eight or nine hour run that you did on the treadmill yeah that was the 52.5 uh, mile run that that i did that was uh, that was quite the long day <laughs> <laughs> eight out eight hours and 47 minutes dude so yeah, you you, just, you know that, that was that was one of those days where you mix it up with music, audio books, podcasts. Um, I write a blog too, basically that I send out every morning called the Daily Hustle. So I do a lot of my writing on the treadmill. So as I'm going, I'll keep the phone in this hand, and I've gotten to be an unbelievable typer with with one hand as as I'm running. Well, I. When you are like in hour eight on the treadmill, do you start to get indications from the treadmill saying, dude, are you ever going to stop? I can't keep this up. <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing is the first time that I went over 40, I, I went like 41 miles and it conked out of me at like, I think it was right about mile 40. And so I was worried on this 50, the 52 mile one, if it was going to, if it was going to, you know, bail out or not. And, you know, all us ultra runners, like we, it's, you got to have some form of documentation. Otherwise it didn't happen. Right. So they like one of the, you know, sayings is like, if it's not on Strava, it didn't happen. So the problem with the treadmill on Strava is that, you know, I can't go outside and, and measure my run, but so I'll do it and document these things by boom. Here's mile 10. Here's mile 20. Here's mile 30, 40, 50. And then I think a lot of that too, it's like, when, when you have public declaration, it's a scary thing. But at the same time, at least you know that you're going to prepare. That was the biggest thing about the golf event, where it's like, let them play 24-hour world record golf challenge. Like, that was as intimidating as anything that I've ever done in my life because you spend, we spent two months building up to this event insane basically declaring i'm going after this 47 year old world record that hasn't been touched um in, in, in almost a you know a half of a century and when you put yourself out there it's it's scary yes but at the same time i think if you stay humble in the process then you realize that hey look i'm going to do everything i can to prepare to do that and it's sort of like when you run on the treadmill and if i'm going to go 52 miles 
And I think it's kind of, I've always enjoyed sharing that stuff because there are some people that are going to look at it. They'll be like, dude, you're a whack job. I don't care how far you're running. Just get out of my life. And, and they're not interested. But in my opinion, there's like the motivation that it's able to serve for other people far outweighs, you know, the naysayers or the people that, um, you know, are like, ah, dude, I don't want to hear about it or whatever else. So anyway, Eric, uh, as Larry mentioned, Casey's a huge Ace fan, and I remember watching you play. The first game I ever saw you was around, I think, May of 2005. I don't know if you've ever seen this picture, but you tackle a guy against the Yankees up in center or right center. Do you have this picture, and what do you remember about that day? Because I was watching, I'm like, look at Burnsy, just take that guy down. Yeah, well, I mean, if the internet connection was better, I wouldn't have showed you guys the picture, and, and, you know, when we were going by the uh, – Oh, you have it? Of, oh, yeah, 100% I have it. Yeah, <laughs> You know, going back, like, you know, Larry, you, you remember this, dude. Like, every, every day it seemed like someone was running on the Coliseum field. And it just – at once stopped. And so, finally, there were two guys that ran on the field that day, right? Yeah. And one of them had a diaper on, and the other one was this dude. And so, the dude <laughs> with the diaper was, like, doing figure eights around Mark Kotze. And Kotze's sitting there like this, like, not moving at all. And then – the other guy starts coming straight at me. And at this point, I was fed up. I had kind of had enough with everything that was going on. And so he's sprinting at me. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to let this guy barrel into me. So I sprinted right at, his, right at him, just like, let's go. And so I started running at him. And then that's when he veered off and went for uh, the wall. Yep. And I think just instinct took over where – I didn't think much – I, I really didn't, obviously, think much about it. But I just chased after him and grabbed him, pulled him down from the wall. And then um, the, uh, the security came and got him. And they gave me a baton. Uh, Oakland PD gave me a baton and handcuffs the next day as a, <laughs> as a, th as a thank you present. That's awesome. Did you, tell, did you tell the guy, this is how I did Tom Brady too? <laughs> 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 no, I, 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 love, I left Brady out of that one. I mean, right. ultimately, Brady, I think Brady's got the last, last, on, uh, the last laugh on all of us. <laughs> Is that, that's not your first case of uh, being a vigilante, right? Didn't you stop somebody trying to rob your house in college? What is that story? Nice, Casey. Yeah, yeah that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's one of the, the craziest things that's obviously ever happened in my life. Like, you wake up. So essentially, I was at UCLA. I was a sophomore, and I, I had three roommates that were not baseball players. And we were playing SC the next day. It was like a Saturday night. It was right before spring break. And all three of my roommates – I didn't go out. All three of my roommates went out, came home, drunk as could be, pass out. And so now it's like 2 in the morning. And it's probably now 2.30, I guess. And I hear like some rumbling um, you know, on my desk. and, and you know, I was, I'm a light sleeper anyway. I wake up, and there was a dude that was literally like this. This is the angle. You wake up, this is what I see, like, going through stuff like that. So my bed would be like, I was sleeping this way, right, looking back this way at him. And so I just kind of figured, I'm like, I got a few different options right here. I could say, hey, what are you doing? Um, you know, and then this guy might have a, a knife or a gun. Um, there actually was a stabbing up the street. Uh, Pretty soon, it was like the weekend before that, uh, where these girls came home. And there was a dude waiting in the uh, in the shower with a knife, like this cre creepy sort of stuff. Exactly. So we we were on edge, basically, right? And then, um, you know, the other option would have been to just pretend like you're sleeping, and you know, hopefully he leaves. And then the third option was like, man, I mean, I'll just take action and then ask questions later. So. I curled up in like a little ball like this and then flew out of bed in kind of one motion. Just I it, it, here, like, I'll tell you, you always want to hit with these two knuckles. And if you do hit with these two knuckles and you, and you catch someone flush, you won't even feel it. And un unfortunately, I, you know, when I was a kid, I had to grow up scrapping a little bit because I always played with the older kids and I wasn't afraid to back down to anybody. And but it's still like never in my life had I ever hit anything so flush and then just bam. So he crumbled down. My roommate was like wakes up simultaneously as this whole thing's happening. 
um, literally like blood everywhere. And LA, uh, my other roommate comes in and he calls uh, LAPD. So first university PD, then LAPD comes in and, and basically like just gave this dude the third degree, no pun intended, but like, you know, what are you doing in here? Where are you from? This and that. the guy's just like, let's go. And so they end up tossing him down our cement staircase. It was gnarly. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, and then, and then hauled him away. And then a month later, I actually, I had to go to court. Uh, and, and apparently he pled guilty. So I didn't have to testify, but it was, um, yeah, sort of a, a weird thing. And then the next day I, I ended up getting the game winning hit against SC. And so, by this time, like the you know the the whole thing circulated around that you know what had happened and the the, the L A papers, which they never write anything about college baseball ever. Like we're lucky to get a box score. So the next day after that, uh, there, the headline was Burns KOs Intruder then SC. Nice, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Fantastic. That's fantastic. That's cool. Casey, do you have? Uh... Your Burns jersey. Oh somewhere? yeah, so I'll, I'll show you. Are you able to see me, Eric? When you when yeah, you're talking, I know on your you're on your phone. I um, see you. He's got you. He's got you. So I when Larry said we were booking you for the pod, I was like, dude, I gotta go look through my drawers. So I think I have something. And so I found this. It's a wow. The, the green screen set up. It's the actual Eric Burns A's sure. jersey. Yeah. Is it- well, that's just a shirt, man. It's, it's a shirt. It's a shirt jersey. It's a jersey. Yeah, it's a shirt. It's a shirt jersey. Yeah, I mean, man. You, but it's just you, funny because I was like, kept, I, I know I used that. to have that, and so I remember getting that because it's things like that, that that kind of like that energy that you have, and just watching you play was so much fun. And I remember copping this thing way back in the day, and it's I still hung onto it somehow through many moves. So See, that's what's crazy about that is that I mean, it's a shirt. Right, it's yeah. a shirt jersey, and so like shirt jerseys. At some point, you're getting rid of them. If that was a normal jersey, that would make sense. Like it's just a jersey. We keep jerseys, right? But a shirt jersey, nah. So that's uh, Casey. I'm impressed, man. Very <laughs> nice. Uh, let's let's get some some truth to this story. He sleeps in that every night, Eric. Every I mean, night, yes. Come yes. on, like he found it in the closet. That's just nonsense. That's that's he's been wearing it for about a decade. Just you know, that's. That's his normal sleepwear. But anyway, um, so um, we should actually get some news out of this. I, I'm very disappointed <laughs> that there were seven other podcasts done because I, I was counting on exclusive content today, <laughs> uh, not, you know, uh, the, the eighth version of the story. But uh, you know the Major League Baseball proposal that's been leaked about having 30 teams go to Arizona and basically put them in the biosphere and quarantine and play. Uh, as a former player, do you see this as a viable option? Yeah, 100%. I, I think it's great that Major League Baseball would um, be so innovative enough to, to think about doing something like this. Um, I, you know, I, I truly believe that, you know, the players want to play and, and they don't care. And there's huge financial uh, – ramifications and, and and also you know rewards that sit there whether they don't play or do play so i think they they want to get out there and do it um from a fan's perspective i think we all would love it right like no matter what we want to see this s show happen um and i think you know ultimately Rob Manfred, Tony Petiti, the people in the MLB front office, they, they're not afraid to do things that are outside of the box. And so when you have a commissioner and you have a guy like Tony, who I used to work for at MLB Network, who is willing to try these things to be innovative and, and also in this whacked out crazy time and world that we're living in right now, why not? Um, and so I, I'm really excited to, to hopefully see this thing happen. Obviously, the safety of uh, the players and the umpires and the clubhouse workers. I mean, there's so many people that are involved. So when you say quarantine, Larry, like, like they literally almost need to be living in this biosphere sort of thing. Now, that said, I, you know, from all I've heard, I, I'd have to 
look at it, but Arizona hasn't been hit as hard. Um, but then again, you look at the travel, it's still taking place on the, on the West coast compared to the, like the New York area, uh, where you haven't seen any movement. So that's a little more concerning that uh, because of that travel, but if you can quarantine these kids off and, um, you know, they can make it safe for everybody. I, I think the, the country could use a little boost like this right now. But from a logistical standpoint, I mean, if you're talking about, let's say uh, you're a current player, right? And you go to, to Terry, your wife, and say, hey, I'll see you in five months. Well, at, after the way you've given her this birthday celebration, she might say go. But, but I, honestly, I mean, to, to be separated from your, your wife and kids, your three kids, for months at a time, I, I, I just don't know the, how viable that is. Well, I mean, you, you want to go back to the World War II days when, you know, Ted Williams takes off for, for, for two years, right? And, you know, we, we're asking these guys to, to go to Arizona and play baseball. We're not asking them to go off to war. And, you know, I think everything's perspective. So, uh, you know, is this some sort of great noble sacrifice these guys would be making? I won't go that far, but I do think that there's probably a lot of players uh, who would take some pretty good pride in the fact that, hey, man, you know, we're going, we're going off to play, right? We're not, we're not going off to war, but we're going off to play and to do something to try to help boost the morale um, of, of a country and, and a world in need of it right now. I do agree where if you tell me I had to leave my wife and three children right now for five months, like it's, I'm in a different stage of my life. But when you're in that playing mode still, and you have these blinders on, that's just like nothing's getting in my way. This is my number one priority in life. I, I would have had no problem. Now that said, I was also single for just about the entire time I played. And, and so it's a, it's a, it's a much different story. Um, so I don't, I, you know, then again, I don't know how many objections there would be. And I also think it's probably more realistic to think that, you know, I got to believe that the, the wives and the, the children at some point would, would at least have these quote unquote, like visitation rights. Right. Um, but, but who knows? Do you see that? I know they're talking like, double headers of seven inning games and all these other crazy things. Do you see any possible way they try to get in 162? To me, that just seems insane. They should just chop it at this point. Yeah, no, Casey, you're right. Like 162 doesn't make a lot of sense. Why, why, why? it's not, it's not a number um, that we're married to, right? I, I mean, I watched 61 last night and what was it? They used to play a hundred, 154 games and they made the big deal about Roger Maris and, having to break the record with 154. And it's just like, look, like nobody cares that we play 162 games this year. What people care about is that we play baseball. And so long as they're able to go out there, I'd, I'd rather see them chop it down to kind of what the schedule is supposed to be, rotate them through all the ballparks and do whatever they do. Um, but, yeah, you, you, you try to play as many 980 games as possible. And I think there are things that – you know, you can add into it. I, I love the fact that they're, they are saying that because – so the umpire is not breathing on the catcher. Hey, perfect time to implement the automated strike zone. Oh, um, yeah. I, I've been asking for that for a while anyway, so might as well lump it in there. Yeah, exactly. And so then I think the, I think the extra inning element, I, I, ever since I saw it in the WBC, I, I fell in love with the extra innings for throw runners on base, first and second, second and third load up the bases as far as I'm concerned, um, just, to, just to promote action and get the games over with quicker. I think seven innings, you know, now it's like, you know, the starting pitcher, and he can't – the starting pitcher, he came back a little bit last year because everything's become so bullpen-oriented, right? So now, you know, they're trying to implement the rule where you have to stay in for a certain amount of batters and whatnot. That, Jesus, seven innings sounds nice to me. I'm actually – I'm not completely opposed to it. Whether, you know, like let's cram the double headers seven after seven after – yeah, no, I, I won't do that. Um, but, yeah, there are certain things that I, I would love to see happen. Um, and I think ultimately baseball has a chance of coming out better um, out of this than it was before. 
Eric, do you think that that would create some urgency? Say, if we go to make make drastic rule changes, seven innings, 144 games, like long term, they obviously have to be collectively bargained. But do you think that that would help baseball maybe get back to America's pastime? You're competing with football and basketball all the time. They always talk about length of games and those kind of things. Do you think that would help if the if the players never wouldn't buy in? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things um, that need to happen for baseball to continue to be. Um, as significant uh, of a player as it, as it has been for the past 150 years. I think number one, it's like every generation has to captivate the next generation. So kids are still playing. Kids love the sport. Little league's participation um, is, is continued to go, on, uh, go up. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it's different. Um, I, I think, you know, now seeing it with my own kid and going through the travel ball stuff, um, I think there's some really good parts about it. I think there's some really disgusting parts about it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that the state of the game when it comes to keeping the ball in play is really important. Less strikeouts, less walks, more action. Um, and the question becomes, how are we going to do that? And that's why I think Major League Baseball has, has played around with all these things in the Atlantic League, including moving the mound back. You know, look, guys used to not throw 100-plus miles per hour. Like, there used to be, what, maybe one or two guys in the, in the entire league that could do that. And now it's just these guys are a dime a dozen. And so, you know, then the other thing is with the launch angle and, and what, you know, guys are trying to do um, when it comes to the extra base hits and getting on base. And so there's a lot of things that, that we need to do. But ultimately, it's, it's appeal to the next generation. And so – the next generation, like we, we want stuff quick. I say we, but you know, my my kids are their attention spans. You know, and part of it is we're to blame um, for creating this, but they're short. And so, uh, you know, when we can get a game that's more fast paced, that's more action, um, the broadcast could become way more entertaining. And I think that's where he comes into, I believe it was leaked out too, that they want to mic up the players. They want yeah. to get the players of it. 100%. Like, all of that stuff, it's like we, we want to consume it. We want to consume it differently. We, we're more it, – it's funny because we're more intimate now than we ever have been in our entire lives. I know it sounds really weird, right? But, but it's like we want, to, we want everything more personal. Right. Because we went through this phase of like the, you know, the traditional broadcast and they said, no, what fans want is they want communication. Uh, you want to broadcast like, for example, if the three of you guys are watching a game like, boom, let's go. Like, let's watch the game together. That's a broadcast. Like, that's that's the idea of, of, of what I think this generation wants. They want communication um, and they want to consume content in, in a in a fast paced, different an interactive way. The question is, how do we how do we give that to them? Well, you're an amazing content creator at this point, <laughs> yeah. and uh, not just on social media, but I want to bring it back to uh, the meeting that we had a couple of months ago because I, I was fortunate enough to be invited to the the sneak preview of the documentary that you put together for the Let Them Play Foundation, and. This is an incredible undertaking. The video is unbelievable. And I don't know how you survived going cross country, but maybe you can just give a little summary for everybody out there that may not be familiar with what you did. I, I don't know how you kept going because, I mean, your, your body's just not supposed to work this way, but you pushed yourself through every obstacle, even when it looked like, oh, this guy's toast. Hmm. Yeah, so basically, kind of sum it up as quickly as possible. My wife and I started uh, a foundation called Let Them Play right after we tried to put our kids in uh, public school. We figured out that there wasn't a public school in our area that had everyday PE. And knowing what PE did for me, uh, not only physically, but mentally, and it, it essentially allowed me to concentrate, like, I want my kids to have that same sort of thing because I would come out of PE and mind would be stimulated. So then I was able to go into class and focus and whatnot. And so we started this foundation because not everybody has um, the opportunity to put their kids in private school and to pay that money. And so what we did is we wanted to raise money for, for phys- 
physical education programs, and then also after school youth activity programs. 60% of kids do zero after school youth activity. Kids are spending seven to nine hours a day on screens. And, you know, I've always been somebody that I'm not just going to tell you how to do it. I, I prefer to be out front and lead by example. And so we decided to use my unique background in um, Major League Baseball and then also uh, the ultra endurance world and, you know, conceptualize this um, triathlon across the country, which was a seven mile swim across the San Francisco Bay, a 2,400 mile bike to Chicago and a 905 mile run. And then along the way, we stopped at different major and minor league parks and handed out grants to these different youth activity organizations. And, you know, the impact that we were able to make on the process was just incredible. I remember, I mean, it started off really in Sacramento. When we handed a check to a youth Latino soccer team. It was a thousand bucks. I mean, just nothing, right? Give them a check, new uniforms, new, new balls. That was a, that's the grant they applied for. Here you go. Here's a thousand bucks for new uniforms, new balls. Guy had a tear in his eye. And so when we were able to do that and go into Salt Lake and Rose Park Little League and hand out that check and like the, the, the gratitude that you saw and, and more, more than that, it was just like the impact that we knew that we were actually making. You guys still there? Yeah. yeah. The, the impact that, that, you know, we knew we, we were making at this grassroots level was, was, was heavy um, and, and was super awesome. So, you know, we ended up um, documenting the whole thing and it was a little bit of the Griswolds, uh, you know, meets crazy endurance triathlon across the country type thing. Um, there's some really funny, uh, awesome, whacked out moments. Um, and there's some really educational moments when it comes to the youth inactivity epidemic. And, you know, not only that, I don't like, and this is one of the things that the, the film producer and I, uh, his name's Eric Cochran, he did a terrific job. But what we talked about when we were putting together this, this, um, this movie, it's like, dude, we need to we need to have a solution. We don't. I don't just want to tell people about this problem. Like, how are we going to fix it? Plus, besides, you know, us going across the country just handing out checks. How do we fix it? And so there was a school in Colorado called Pagosa Springs in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. And basically, this school implemented it's called zero zero period PE, where they took all their students and they did it first with a small group, right? And and they would put them through these physical activity exercises, nothing, nothing big. The, the, one of the teachers would get in Captain America suit and do like jumping jacks on top of a uh, jumping jacks on, on, on top of the, the gym and, and just get the kids all fired off. They do snowshoeing one day or whatever it was. And their test scores literally just skyrocketed. I know we're obviously we're in spring training. I was there for the giants and A's. What are your thoughts on them? And what do you know about them so far going this year? You got Gabe Kapler and the A's. Expect to be a probably a World Series contender. Um, I think the Giants are going to be interesting because they're not going to be very good. Um, so we'll see what happens. It's a um, uh, unique staff that they put together, so it'll be interesting to see how that um, plays out as well. It's not. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to rush to judgment one way or another. Or if they, you know, win 65 games, is how are we really supposed to gauge? Yeah, you know how and what. Like, I think the best way you want to, if you want to take a look at what Gabe Kapler and his staff do this year, I would look at the Vegas OU tour. Right, what are they supposed to win? What do they win? Um, you know, and then I think ultimately, you know, what's really important is is you know you're not only managing the players, but you're managing the relationship between the front office and the ownership of the fans, and it's a it's a big job that, you know, I think the San Francisco Giants have had a, a longstanding tradition of, of having some really uh, respected characters uh, in that spot. And so, you know, I think like anything else in life, you know, we got to go out and earn it. So I'm sure Gabe Kapler is probably thinking the same thing. He's going to go out and, and do his best to try to earn the respect of the Giants fans to let them know that he's the right guy to lead them into the future. Uh, as far as the A's are concerned, I had an opportunity to play for Bob Melvin, uh, you know, one of the best managers if not the best manager that I ever played for um and it's it's amazing what him and uh you know that squad continues to do year in and year out obviously David Forrest and Billy Bean um you know they're magicians with uh the way they put together teams and nothing but love and respect for those guys and in that organization so um you know spent a lot of good years there but 
you know, more importantly, it's like, it, you know, when the A's, when the A's are good, like it's, there's some like true sort of fandom that comes out in me. And, and I don't, obviously it's probably because I played there and whatnot, but, you know, I think I take a lot of, of pride in, in that squad at the network too. And, and, you know, I, we all in a way have these little secret, I don't say kid, you know, cause you're trying to be objective and, and I try to be, um, but I, I like when you root for a team. I like when a team, um, you know, comes together and you have guys like Chapman and Olsen and just like, man, these guys are easy to root for. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, even Mania too. So it just it seems like great guys, great people, great culture that's been created and, and more than created the fact that it's been just, I, I don't know what he said, carried on for all these years. Cause it was there before I got there. And there was obviously it was there when I was there. And it's been there ever since. And so they've just done a terrific job of, of, uh, of creating a, a sustainable culture. Yep. You know, before we let you go, I know we got to let you go. It is your wife's birthday and everything. But <laughs> you've created a series of posts on social media of how you're handling this home quarantine with your kids that I think is entertaining the heck out of all of us every day. So, I mean, what is – what is going on in the Burns household behind the scenes? I know you tried to show us a tour, but I mean, keeping everybody active, just being nuts in the snow, all that stuff is so funny. Did you, I mean, did you guys see the kid, my kids, when we went downstairs? Like that swing? Yeah, I did. Yeah. We saw the swing a little bit. It was like, it was a little choppy, but we definitely saw it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's it. They make it easy for me, right? Today, I walked outside to check on them and dudes on a skateboard ripping down into a snowbank and then doing a full flip off like just where what are you doing i mean so i think i get a i get a lot of my inspiration from them and watching them do stuff and then i i decided to take it to uh to the next level but i think more than anything with with all these things uh, there's two things that i look at like what <sighs> As goofy as some of these things are when they're baseball related, I actually love, I love the opportunity to teach the game. I love the opportunity to be able to pass the game on to the next generation. I mean, here. All right. So, I mean, look at this. What's up, dude? Hey, show them your little, do your little thing with the flip. See no. if that works. Show these guys. I want to see it. Watch this. Let's see it. Show them. What, what is he, a Kempo Karate Kid? Yeah. So, Larry, you know my, my dad was a fourth degree black belt in Kempo. I'm not kidding. And, and I, I grew up I grew up in, you know, the, the Kempo Karate was my background, um, going to the international uh, karate championships every year. And uh, that was, yeah, that was, it's weird because my dad never played baseball. And, and I always kind of wondered how or why that translated. Uh, so we pulled out the swords. He, he, you know, he passed away in 2011, but he left me these three uh, swords, six swords. And so they just kind of sit there, and every now and then I'll let Colton mess around with them. And so the other day we got it. We got the swords, and we were throwing fruit to each other, <sighs> slicing right through these things. I saw on Instagram if you want to check it I out. Saw it, yeah. I, I, oh, yeah, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, we saw that one, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I feel like with your videos – you're morphing into motivational speaker Matt Foley. Uh, <laughs> living in a van down by the river. Yeah, man. I, it's, here's the thing. It's, it's funny because I had no intentions of trying to become uh, the next Tony Robbins. <clears throat> but, you know, I think along the way, as I've done my best to accumulate um, – knowledge accumulate experiences which sort of translates to which is supposed to translate to, to wisdom along along the way i i feel like i've i've learned a lot of lessons that were sharing and so when i wrote a book i the, now this book took seven years to write like i went through a really tough transitional period of my life when i got done playing baseball and then right after that my dad passed away and you know i was getting into the, the iron mans and the ultra marathons and everything it was just um, it was a it was a 
transitional time and, and it was a time of reflection. And so I just started writing. And when I, when I was a, a kid, I, I loved writing. It was the best thing. Um, I, I wouldn't have gotten through UCLA without it. Like really, it was like the one thing that I just, I would just nail. And I've, I've become consumed with it, right? And the sort of ADHD kid, ADHD kid that becomes hyper-focused. Um, and, and I love creative writing. So I wrote this book. It was, it's called The Effort List, Life Lessons from a Human Crash Chest Dummy. And, and, and again, it's kind of the same idea and principle of the documentary, the Let Them Play documentary. It's like, I don't just want to give you, like, don't, you want to read about my life. Yeah, there's some fun stories and whacked out stories and whatever else in there. But what value am I going to give you with that? And the same thing with the doc. What value? What, what are we learning here? And so um, at the end of each chapter, that's where the whole life lessons from the human crash just dummy came in is I, would, I drew out the lessons from, from each chapter. And these are stuff that I'm constantly reminding myself. And it's what I do with the Daily Hustle, which is the blog that I write and the podcast that I do five days a week. Um, it's just it's an extension of the book because the one thing I champion with the book, I'm like, look, it's a mentality, it's a lifestyle. And it's funny how sometimes like life choose, I don't know, certain things in life choose you as opposed to you choosing it. I would have never said this is the direction that I was aiming to go. But when I started to see the real impact that it could have on a certain amount of people, it, it hit home. It's like, you know what? I'm going to keep doing this because my intentions were not to continue to do this. I was, I was going to write the book and be done. Then it's like, no, man, no. And this is, it's, it is, a lot of that is, is, is representative of who I am and, and everything, um, everything that I'm about, which is a daily routine, which is literally, it's like, we are, we are, show me, show me what you do and I'll show you who you are. Right. We're, we're, we're people of action. And so, um, you know, it was Epictetus and I've gotten a lot into Stoic philosophy and stuff, but basically, you know, like, don't tell me your philosophy, embody it, show me it, live it. Don't speak this bull to me. I want to see it happen. And that's, uh, that's something that my dad taught me. And it's something that I think, you know, and maybe this is probably the reason why and how I got into all this is because, you know, this is sort of what he was like. Now he wasn't like this on any sort of public scale, but this is how he was to me. This is all the, the, you know, knowledge and wisdom that I was able to, to get from him. And he said, there's two things in life I can give you that no one can ever take away education and experience. So, so long as you keep learning and so long as you keep charging, like keep learning and keep going, keep learning, keep going. So that's, um, that's kind of how this whole thing's come together. Well, we'll wrap it up. We've done uh, like 45 plus minutes here. I haven't seen one step on a treadmill. I don't know how that happened uh, because I've been hearing a lot about okay. eight hours, nine hours. I see nothing. Uh, so there's that. But also, uh, please tell your lovely wife, Tara, that we are very sorry to interrupt her birthday with the eighth podcast that you recorded today. Uh, and we have to pick this. We didn't even get into the list of presidents, William Howard Taft, all of that. 27. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. We'll, we'll pick it up, but let them play foundation documentary. And Eric, thank you so much. Uh, I hope to see you on the set of the MLB network soon. Cause that means we're having games. I know. I know. Yeah. I appreciate you guys having me on And so if, if for anyone to go check out the film, they're going to let them play film dot com let them play film dot com and it's uh it's worth the watch i i think it's something that um is educational um and ideally something that you know someone else would be able to see and then continue to help champion the cause to to, to getting our kids active again amazing and inspiring uh have a good night and uh we'll Larry, talk thanks soon. man yeah right. chris thanks dude casey uh thank you Eric. sleep sleep well in my jersey man <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. I All right. Love it. Take care to your wife. Thanks, man. All right, dudes. See you again. Bye, guys. <laughs> With authority.